Okay, let's going to start our wrap up webinar for our COVID-19 virtual biohackathon. Thank you everybody for being here with us today. Thank you everybody for participating from this webinar, uh, from this biohackathon and for all the contributions that you have done so far and the contributions that we know you will continue doing as a post-hackathon um, activity. Uh, we will share uh, this presentation. It's been recorded by now and uh, we will share it via YouTube. We will announce uh, the links on the Slack channel and also on our mailing list. And we will add all these links uh, to the GitHub repository as well. So maybe I will go back here. I want to organize, uh, to thank her today to Piotr, who started this initiative, to Tasro, who has um, contributed to the main organization of this event. And well, I am Leila Garcia, in case you're wondering. And I have been contributing to the organization of this event as well. So just a quick reminder, our GitHub um, repository, the Twitter we are using for this event, the hashtag, question and answers on Slack, please use the channel QA. We will have all the questions and answers there. During today webinar, we will also have one or two questions per topic that will go live. Uh, Jane will help us monitoring uh, those and she will randomly select uh, one question per topic to go live. We will also share a survey um, later. Um, it will be the, the following week because we, we know, um, we want to know how to improve uh, this event, what you like, what you didn't, and um, well, how we can do it better next time that we have an opportunity. Slack will remain open and we will do a backup when our full version, supported version uh, ends, but Slack will remain open. So please um, feel using it if you want to, to chat with your fellows and your topics and everyone on the Slack as well. Okay. So announcing about Biohack Archive, we have been kind of uh, pinging all the coordinators here and there because we would love to uh, have your contributions, your reports about your activities during this Biohackathon in our Biohack Archive per print. Um, please be aware that uh, we are still finalizing the guidelines, so be patient with us. And if you have any, any comments, well, they are more than welcome, of course. Um, we will ask you to please acknowledge uh, the event. This will help us, not only us, but any other biohackathon participating in this biohack archive initiative, to do some follow up on, on the um, activities and the outcomes. And if you have any question about this biohack archive initiative, please ping us on the biohack archive channel on Slack. We are happy to answer any questions. No, actually, we have oh, two yeah, parts to Thomas. So, <laughs> Thomas, sorry about the confusion. Please go ahead. No worries, no worries. Um, so the anthology group had basically two big topics. I present the first one, and that was supporting the public sequence resource that we think about with the metadata. So what we, we did do was to create a profile about the metadata that you have to give us when you submit a raw sequence to this project. Um, what happened? We created this profile. We included that in the pipeline. Um, we included that in the web interface. Big thanks to the people that helped us with that. Um, Adam, for example, but also other people I think contributed. We used uh, a certain library from Peter to turn our YAML file into REF. And also Jose Labra helped us creating shacks shapes um, for, for our metadata. So quite a few things happened um, post hackathon. We want to further improve our schema. And even though we created the sh uh, shapes, we didn't include those yet in the pipeline. So for the QC. So there's things for us to do after the bio hackathon. And we agreed that we would contribute the next couple of weeks to try to finish this off. The next slide is just a screenshot. So you can see a little bit what we accomplished on the left side, that's a screenshot of 
uh, of the public sequence resource and there is the metadata now in there tied to the results of the workflow so we're making good progress there and on the right side you have a, a visualization of the schema as it is at the moment so that's what we've been doing and what we have been thinking about and robert's going to present now the next part of the ontology group Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we will finish the whole ontology part then, and then we will see if anyone has any questions for you or Robert. Robert, please welcome and go ahead. Thank you. So this is a continuation of the first part of uh, what the ontology group has been working on. Only this part focuses more on the actual domain ontologies needed to capture the information, in particular to capture both qualitative and quantitative data for patients such as in case reports form or other kinds of metadata so this might include things like blood pressure or different uh, um, oxygen saturation values and so on and there are a number of ontologies for this for the qualitative information there are a number of phenotype ontologies and they are quite widely used for quantitative traits uh, we were basing our work on the clinical measurement ontology, the CMO, which is part of the RGD infrastructure, and use this to characterize quantitative traits, and then we have a data model for representing these quantitative traits together with units um, and the assay that came up to them. And what we have done is we wanted to combine these quantitative and qualitative traits so that we can link them formally. And we started mining lexically the labels and the synonyms of the clinical measurement ontology by annotating them with uh, anatomy, chemicals, and quali uh, qualities from PATO. And then we uh, constructed axiom patterns, and axiom patterns which would define or somehow constrain the classes in the CMO so that through these axioms we can link them to HPO, to the mammalian phenotype ontology and other phenotype ontologies. And you can see on the right hand side a screenshot of the hierarchy. You can see this is based on the mammalian phenotype ontology, uh, somewhere in the immune system phenotype. And then there are immune system measurements and different types of measurements and they're intermixed based on the axioms. Uh, we can find, generally, we find the quantitative trait and then it's refined by the qualitative trait, so, which is essentially the value uh, being increased, decreased, and the trait itself would be represented using uh, a data model uh, that we have also worked on. This extends the phenopacket standard, so this Global Alliance for Genomics and Health phenopacket standard. Um, and we have a schema where we can take these quantitative measurements together with the qualitative measurements and make them a part of, a, of, a, of the submission. And the next work is still to incorporate the schema from the first uh, two slides of the ontology group, extend the schema so that we can put this data model applied directly within that and add this quantitative information. And finally, one last thing that we have noticed and where we have started thinking about is that we would really need an ontology to also capture epidemiological concepts or classes. There are quite a few ontologies which contain them and where they're spread out. And we have uh, collected some which, from different ontologies, such as the statistics ontology, and we have made a list of concepts that we would like to capture. These are also quantitative traits, but they're quantitative traits of populations, not of individuals. And we are considering applying this same model also to populations in order to, uh, in order to capture quantitative epidemiological measurements. Thank you very much, Robert. Do we have any questions for Robert or Thomas regarding the ontology board during this biohackathon? I don't see anything on the QA channel but uh, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question right now. Panelists, of course, you can raise your hands as well. No questions at this time. I, I will make a comment. Um, we would be very interested in seeing uh, the population um, elements that you 
will include in this ontology that you just mentioned at the end of your presentation, Robert, because um, we, we might need it for our knowledge craft later. So we will follow up your, your work. Okay, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Thomas. And now let's going to move uh, to the next topic, Pandinom with Eric. Please, Eric. Yes, Go hello. Ahead. Yes, Hi. thank you. Hi, so uh, the pan-genome group was basically split among a lot of different sub-projects that are also happening. But we came together to talk a bit about, about what was going on. Um, and so there, there's a, an issue with SARS-CoV-2 specifically, which is that there doesn't, at least within this, this radiation, there's not a lot of genomic diversity. So some of the pan-genomic techniques that we might be interested in applying in other contexts don't make a lot of sense here. They're not essential, let's say. Um, but perhaps this will change in time. Um, and it's also limited by the data the availability we have. We're, we're often working with um, reference guided assemblies that have been made, and, and they, they will not have um, large variants in them, if, even if they do exist. So there, there was an interesting kind of finding, which is that some of the, the variation graph-based tools, like Sequish, are, are very scalable in comparison to, to, uh, to techniques that are usually used for multiple sequence alignment, and so that can possibly help us. Um, yeah, so then in terms of what we actually did, we helped out other groups, like most specifically workflows, phylogeny, also the sequence data uh, resource. And after the hackathon, I'd like to complete um, this tool that, this is really my contribution. I was working on a tool called Maffer, which converts the GFA format, represents graphs, into a multiple alignment format, which is uh, suited for MSA description, multiple sequence alignments. Um, and it, it would be interesting, too, if people in this group are interested in doing it, to work on a, a SARS-CoV-2 2, SARS -CoV -2 pen genome paper. Um, but that may be something longer in the works. Yes, it, it could, uh, could take a bit, particularly for what you just said, that there is no much diversity. Do you have any second slide, Eric? Or uh, For this note, there, there's another uh, subgroup which wasn't, Name, I guess it's a subgroup of the pangenome group, which is working on assembly. Those are the following okay. slides. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's go so and continue with assembly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So the assembly group kind of grew out of the pangenome group because we were interested in applying some of the kinds of techniques that had been developed for, for working on collections of genomes to collections of short and long reads from these viral genomes. So the, there are two approaches we focused on. One was um, just selecting really long reads that looked like a full virus from a uh, RNA sequencing data set that we had available and, and trying to make um, a kind of assembly out of those through alignment. And this works, but it, it produces a kind of messy result because we need to, we need to polish it. Um, and it, it has very low effective coverage across the genome. So then we, in, in kind of parallel, we focused on tuning the Shasta assembler for an Oxford nanopore data to work on the viral RNA. Uh, and uh, this looked like it was going to be really hard, but actually seems to work almost. And, and maybe with some better data, it would be ideal. So post-hackathon, we'd like to, um, or to have basically document the work, and, and hopefully that's going to be possible. So the next slide shows some interesting results from this. So this is um, a bandage plot of the Shasta assembly graph that's produced by this method. Um, and, and basically, there's this large component at the top. You have lots of apparent diversity within it. Some of those bubbles are kind of artifactual due to very high, high read coverages in part of the genome. And then you have this long tail, uh, and that's where the, the coverage becomes lower. And then it breaks, actually. And then some of the segments below represent parts of the viral genome as well. So the, on the next slide, um, there's a description of that. So we can see uh, on the left is actually the reads across the reference assembly. Just to show you what's happening, there's just very few reads actually covering the whole, the whole genome. We mostly have them in one end. This is a consequence of the way the sequencing is done. There's this polyadenylation signal that's being pulled down. Um, and so you get things that have uh, a strong, um, a strong um, a bias toward one end of the genome that's polyadenylated. And the other two figures just show, one, one is an alignment visualization of the same in the middle um, and then the other like a dot plot and then the other is an alignment against the the, the pan genome or rather really against the alignment of contigs from the assembly against the um, against the reference so it's promising but this issue about the data quality is difficult it seems like it would work if we just had 
a bit more data from that end of the of the sequence. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I think the next group would be the pan genome browser. So let's going to have yep. these uh, before going to questions. So we have the three pan genome related groups together. Uh, Simon, if you are presenting this one, please go ahead. Um, so I'm Josiah Seaman. Simon will be presenting the next slide. Um, uh, so we actually wanted to get the pan genome browser group up even before the hackathon. So we've got our own uh, website, graphgenome.org. And we staged a bunch of issues. And uh, so we had a really productive uh, hackathon. So it was really great to have everyone. Um, we, uh, we have this front end browser where we had kind of a basic prototype already and we've greatly expanded it. We've added the ability to see individual nucleotides uh, at, in, inside of the browser. Um, and then basically the, what the idea here is, is that um, we're, we're looking at graph genomes. And so these, these links that you're seeing, uh, these um, colored arrows show rearrangements uh, in, in this case, a, a viral pan genome. Um, and uh, then we're also working on, um, Jorg was working on coloring by provenance. Uh, and so the idea is that we'd like to start being able to track where different vi uh, viral assemblies came from. Uh, and so that's, that's here on the bottom. And uh, we looked at how, how to look at the different scales of um, uh, basically allele frequency of a, of, a, of a structural variant. Okay, Simon, why don't you take it away? Okay, good. So uh, this is the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the right, you can see basically an overview of the whole project. So there are a lot uh, of components involved in there. So that's why it's somehow hard to synchronize. And in this pipeline, we did uh, some kind of improvements. So now we have in Ochi, in the graph building step, it now is able to output the nucleotide positions for each bin and for each path. So later, when we uh, visualize these bins and components, we can actually match them to the annotation provided by a Sparkle endpoint and then visualize it on the nucleotide base pair level. Perfectly exact. <clears throat> And the uh, step between our visualization and the graph building is the so-called component segmentation. Basically, you can imagine a component like a synteny block in an MSA. And we use this part to also pre-compute our zoom levels. And there was a huge amount of improvement in RAM usage and the large speed up at uh, the, the whole tool. <coughs> and Another accomplishment was that we now have the first release of a pan genome ontology. This will help us to put our um, blocks into a Sparkle endpoint, and then everything we need for the visualization will be in a Sparkle endpoint. So the graph, its um, sequence and node positions, our different zoom levels with its components, and then maybe in another endpoint annotation metadata, and then in the end we can all uh, wrap this together in our visualization. What we also did is that we tried to find uh, haplotype blocks um, in COVID-19 pan genome data, which you can see in the lower middle, mm -hmm. and this can help us also in the visualization to further divide it in a more granular way. Yeah. That's it from my side. Okay. Thank you very much to you. Thank you, Simon. Do we have? Uh, yeah, yes. we have one more slide here. More? So, uh, the long term, uh, the long term goal for this is that we want to create uh, a browser that's capable of giving a you know lifetime update for all of the COVID nineteen data. So right now we have the ability to do. Um, SNPs, rearrangements, any kind of sequence variation over thousands of individuals, and it's it's an aligned pan genome. So, uh, so we've got sequence covered, but we also want to see um, uh, we want to see annotations, uh, and we'd like to get into 
uh, the semantic technologies and we're planning on migrating to a triple store so that we can um, uh, you know pull in these these ontologies that other groups are working on uh, with you know patient outcomes and and all of that so that you'll be able to look at you kind of the, the whole uh, diversity uh, of the COVID um, of the virus and then uh, be able to see if there are changes in mortality, changes in infection, um, you know, tri a different triage indicator variants, that sort of thing, and, you know, be able to bring all of that together. So we're going to keep going after this hackathon. So if, if other people want to get involved, um, be, be uh, happy to uh, pull you in. So we're really hoping to hear more from the public sequence resource people, the um, metadata people, maybe even machine learning, um, because we need more um, we need more conclusions to display along with our our sequence. Good, thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, this one was the last uh, slide from Panginom and Panginom Browser. We have one question on the Q and A channel. Robert, do you want to? Please ask your question here as well. Um, yes. Um, so I was just wondering what the purpose, uh, so where will this pangenome ontology play a role and how it is, is it going to be used and how will it interoperate with other ontologies in the domain such as uh, Faldo or so? Um, Simon, you want to take this question? Yeah, I can try. Um, so currently for these variation graphs like Wichi, there already exists an ontology. And what we can do with that also is, for example, just um, take nodes of the graph and we also know the, each position in such a node for each path. And then we can use Faldo to map that to annotations, for example. And the goal of the pan genome ontology is that we will also bring in um, our like component and like visualization schema basically so that we have everything in one place in one triple store and then we can ask sparkle queries and say okay we want to visualize this region with this zoom level and please also fetch the corresponding annotations or metadata or whatever we have for example a uh, faldo uh, like um, file the precision meshing. Does this answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Um, and uh, someone also asked what their website was. It's graphgenome.org. OK, thank you very much. I will take the opportunity um, to make an invitation. Everybody here, if you have genome uh, sequences regarding SARS-CoV-2, or you know any other group that uh, has uh, such sequences, please invite them to contribute to public resources and deposit their sequences there so we can all do analysis on top of it. Thank you very much. Let's going to move to the next group, workflows with Michael Crusoe. Uh, yeah, I can go ahead and talk. And if you get a chance, it's been requested we refresh the slides, though I don't need them refreshed. Yes, of course. Uh, thanks so much. Thank so uh, we successfully delivered the CETABEL and Arvados webinars. The CETABEL webinar is up on YouTube, and our Arvados one will be there soon. You can access it over IPFS for now. So thanks to everybody who attended and asked good questions. Um, we did get those Amazon AWS credits, and we've got quite a lot left, which is great. Viral genomes are small, so that's nice. Um, and we have access to this through the end of July. So this is open to anybody doing any analysis, uh, put it in a CW workflow, or just use Orvedos for data storage. Um, and um, Heiz Molinar um, is actually making Ansible scripts for Orvedos for our uh, migrating some of this to European infrastructures off of Amazon. Um, so it's been really exciting to see this group interact with almost every other group and moving their stuff into production. And um, 
we'll have some more slides, but I do want to say that we are going to continue to collaborate and there'll be new projects. And myself and others are, will continue to be available to help anybody write and convert workflows. The other Michael will take the next slide. Good, uh, but should I should I refresh before this, or is this slide okay for you? Uh, this slide is okay. Okay, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, this is the other Michael. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying, yeah, the workflows group uh, uh, is rather large, and we've been spread out amongst um, lots of the other topic groups as well. Uh, pre hackathon, we started by cataloging. Um, a bunch of the available workflows um, for working on uh, COVID-19. And some of those are still listed here. Much progress was made over the week. Uh, the uh, Vio Recon project at NF Core uh, is being used for real data. Uh, that's very encouraging. Uh, there were lots of improvements made to the Galaxy uh, SARS-CoV-2 workflow. Uh, a lot of the uh, the workflows made for the public sequence resource are in uh, this repository of viral analysis. Um, the V-pipe folks are going to present more in a uh, subsequent slide. Um, and I think uh, Tazro had a, a really good summation of, of what happened uh, here at the hackathon this year. Um, we had lots of different contributors uh, working on workflows in different workflow languages and under Whittle, under CWL, Snakemake, and Nextflow. Uh, and we were all going back and forth between the various workflows, um, learning from one workflow and applying that to another. And uh, it was seriously an impressive week. I, I'm really impressed with the amount of work that was, that was done. We did great. Yeah. <laughs> Go team. Indeed. Let's going to continue with the workflow hub uh, presentation. Oh no, sorry. We have yet another workflow presentation, V pipe. Then we will move to the workflow hub, and we will have um, questions about all the workflow related work. I can see Ivan is being moved as panelist. So please, Ivan, whenever you're ready. I think uh, Ivan Topolsky still needs to be uh, moved as panelist. Jen, please. He's been moved. It's fine. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ivan Tupolsky. I'm uh, working with our group on uh, VPipe. It's a uh, bioinformatics pipeline for a, a viral NGS data that uh, is developed as a resource from the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, which is the Swiss uh, node of Elixir. And we developed it at the Computational Biology Group at uh, ETH Zurich. Uh, we have released uh, um, this week a uh, specific version to analyze NGS data uh, pertaining to uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which uh, has uh, all the default configuration uh, pre-built for uh, this data type of data sets. We managed to improve our new Shora 2 version as an engine for extracting uh, single uh, nucleotide variants and uh, local viral haplotypes. And uh, we export our data as uh, VCF standard format. Um, this uh, workflow is a little bit interesting for several people here because it's written in SnakeMix, so it gives more opportunity to test uh, a different environment uh, for you guys. And we rely also on uh, Bioconda for the installation of our components. And uh, big thanks for the workflows and workflow help. I promise to finish polishing the, the registration of our pipeline in uh, your repository. Big thanks to the public uh, sequence resources guys, because now we have even larger data sets, uh, which are very well curated to test even more stress test our software against. Uh, definitely be interested in visualizing our local uh, haplotypes uh, in the PanGenome browser. And starting from Tuesday, uh, we will start receiving the locally generated NGS data uh, here in uh, Basel, Switzerland. And we hope to be able to also start uploading them on SRA and use the various tools for uh, exports that have been uh, developed here. So thank you very much and uh, happy Easter to uh, all, the, all the animals here around. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. Uh, let's go in 
let's going to move to the COVID workflow hub with uh, Carol, and then we will take questions. Carol, please go ahead. Hello. Um, so I'm representing uh, the COVID uh, workflow hub. Our aim was to build a registry for COVID-19 workflows and uh, to gather them, um, all those workflows you just heard about and the metadata. We we're building on a minimal viable product we built previously, which was very much a development -y type environment. And our metadata is based around the common workflow language that Michael mentioned, uh, RO Crate, which uh, would have been mentioned by Mark in the first uh, presentation, which is a way of doing metadata packaging and bioschema profile markup. So we had stand up meetings every morning and afternoon, 21 people joined in over the week and we had representatives across uh, Europe chiefly. Um, and we have 34 pages of administrative records of what everybody did. So I think we did uh, a lot. Next slide. Um, so the achievements are we, na we have a team, uh, 19 people very actively contributed and we have a hardcore team of 13 people who are going to carry on. We delivered a hub uh, with workflows in it and this will stay in production. It has Galaxy workflows, so we generated the abstract CWL for those workflow descriptions and we have Snakemake, VPipe, thank you very much Ivan. Uh, we have some guides for how to register and support basic curation tasks. Um, we acknowledge uh, Nextflow, CWL, uh, Snake Make Galaxy and nine workflow types, and you can upload arbitrary scripts into it uh, as unrecognized types. We've been debugging various CWL tools associated with the workflows, so Snake Make turned out to be a bit uh, uh, thorny. Uh, Galaxy still has some, some issues to do with recognizing what is an output. Um, and uh, we also are linking up with data files. We had to revise the Bioschema workflow mark, uh, profile, particularly to separate out the metadata for registration versus metadata for workflows. And we're now steering the search engines like Google to the uh, Bioschema, the schema markup in this hub rather than our development hub uh, um, thread. We also had to significantly revise the workflow RO crate, uh, particularly requests not just from us, but also the fair data um topic to um explicitly permit external references and we have uh, started work on an RO crate python library which i think will be useful for both the um, workflow and the fair data uh, topics going forward we also did a big gathering exercise on requirements on contribution incremental metadata gathering and and other related topics next slide so this is a screenshot to show you, we really built it. We really stood it up. So uh, on the left is uh, a list of workflows, which are Galaxy workflows. We have capacity browsing. We have different workflow types there. You can find and download them. On the right is a Galaxy workflow um, out of the, 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 uh, the Galaxy set that was produced in, in the workflow track previously said. Um, they download an RO crate, so this actually has a side effect of you can upload files and then we, we will make the RO crate package for you, which you can then download and distribute as you see fit. We have credit and attribution. There's an abstract CWL, CWL view of the Galaxy workflow, and you can see there that there aren't any outputs because uh, it's tricky to figure out what Galaxy workflow creators' outputs were expected to be. So this is one of the things that got revealed as we did the um, hub development. Next slide. And uh, this is a snake make uh, workflow. This is the um, V pipe. Um, as I said before, um, it turns out the snake make CWL uh, generator was a bit gnarly, um, but uh, we we figured out what's wrong and we're fixing it. And uh, so this will not only present in snake make view, but also in due course in a, a nice abstract uh, using CWL viewer as well. And on the right is uh, how you currently register. You can register a workflow as an RO crate if you package it together, or you can just upload files and we'll make the RO crate for you. Um, so it links to files or you can upload the files. So we have supported this uh, link to reference files or reference places so, because we'll want to be able to reference, say, a Galaxy instance from a URL in the Galaxy registration, not just uh, uh, the Galaxy files. Next. So, post-hackathon, 
Uh, long term, this is going to evolve into the European Open Science Code Life Workflow Hub, which is production. So this is now the production um, workflow hub. So we split into the developer one where we hack around and this will remain stable as the um, production version, which we will then continually um, release uh, features into. The Workflow Hub Club meets every Wednesday, 10 o'clock UTC. The link in the slides takes you to where you can go to in order to join. We have a bunch of stuff to do short term in that club, including the mini publication, which I will write in the Google Doc because I'm not a typesetter, so I will not write it natively in Markdown. Um, we have a bunch of issues to fix immediately. Uh, we're going to help folks like Ivan and uh, the next flow folks particular upload and populate with those workflows and uh, we have some curation tasks that we'll be working on and particularly by the end of this month we uh, plan to register this workflow hub with the open air covid gateway and we've already started conversations with open air in that regard medium term we'll complete the registration also through github harvesting and the ro create through the api our uh, uh, beta release is in July and we already have a code in order to do these, but it isn't currently in the workflow, COVID workflow hub. And we did a lot of stuff, really focused. It was great. And thank you to the workflow and the fair data tracks um, in particular. Thank you very much, uh, Carol. Uh, really nice to see how the different groups are collaborating with each other. This is um, great in biohackathons events and to see how those collaborations will continue after the biohackathon. We are really happy to see that. We have um, now time for some questions for workflow, CPipe and uh, workflow pop. We already have uh, one question from Alex. So Alex, please go ahead. Um, Jane, if you can please unmute Alex uh, Kanit for him to pose his question to Carol. Um, hi, Carol. Hi, everybody else. Um, yeah, my question was whether, uh, first of all, it's fantastic work. It looks really amazing, the workflow hub. So since I'm working uh, um, with uh, Elixir Cloud, and uh, so we are very much interested in, in uh, interfacing with uh, Workflow Hub. We are wondering whether you are already or have plans to or would be up to or interested in uh, supporting GA for GH TRS specs, API specs? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, I predicted this question and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not in our immediate short term. You see the, the list of the immediate short term, which right. is in the next right. six weeks, um, but it is in the medium term. And uh, so it's not the first priority on the list, but it's uh, in the medium term. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And yeah so I probably, I would probably then sign up and uh, to the Workflow Hub Club and then see Please maybe do. and um, advance this or help, help get there because it would be really cool for us. That would be incredibly useful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We're very familiar with these specs, of course. Uh, but uh, we, we kind of prioritized other stuff in, sure. in immediately. But yeah, for sure, please join us. Uh, we meet next Wednesday. All right, cool. That's great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Do we have any other question for Workflows Group? There was a question about the Amazon credits, and I think we added Peter Amstutz to answer it. Um, the question was, can the AWS credits be used for website hosting? Hi, um, yes. Uh, yes, probably. Yeah, to contact me and we'll see if we can set up a, a server for you. Good. Thank you, Michael, uh, for posting the question and thank you, Peter, for your answer. So I think uh, we can move uh, to the next slide. Just in case anyone needs it, I'm going to uh, refresh quickly um, here before going to the next one. Am I refreshing? Also, Leila, Mark is joining Mark? the meeting. Oh, perfect. So let, let's go into, to move to Fair Data. That's amazing. 
Yes. Yeah, sorry. I, I had a little knife emergency when I was making my lunch. <laughs> and delayed Don't me. I had to go to the pharmacy. <laughs> I had to go to the pharmacy, but couldn't get back in time. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Please, Mark, go ahead. Okay. So, again, apologies. So, uh, we've had, I think, a, a fairly uh, successful hackathon. Um, a lot of it was was related around the RO crate spec, um, but it moved very quickly, and we were able to, uh, together with the workflow people, especially with Stian, um, update a, a straw man, at least, of the spec uh, that would allow both file system-based and, and also virtual containers. Um, and I <clears throat> made some tweaks to the Ruby libraries, and so did Finn Bacall, and uh, we generated for the first time a completely virtual uh, RO crate yesterday, which describes all of the GenBank sequences um, <clears throat> that in a sparkable way. Uh, so I, I sent the query out to a couple of the of the groups. Um, we've now got uh, the national data sets from Spain and Italy uh, verified and in an RO crate. Um, as I said, we've got the GenBank uh, coronavirus sequences. Um, there's a, a PXD 107710 proteomics pipe profile. <laughs> we have to thank Phil for that. I don't know what that means, but, <laughs> but he was using frictionless data uh, to, to uh, describe the, in, the internals of, of that data. So we're, we're using crates for the outermost layer of metadata and then frictionless data for the inner uh, metadata. And uh, we started yesterday working with the gene expression team to uh, start collecting all of their inputs, outputs, and workflows in a fair manner. Uh, so that's ongoing. Um, uh, how, how far did we get? Well, we're quite a small team. and We're spread among other teams. And, and I, I was sort of thinking this morning, verification is kind of tedious and boring. <laughs> it's, 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 the, uh, it's the grunt work of, of data science. <laughs> so it's not a lot of fun. And I can understand how we, uh, we sort of kept wandering off into other places that were doing more exciting things. But I think that getting this uh, RO crate spec to be virtual was really important. Yeah. So I'm very pleased that, the, that we worked so closely with the workflow team and especially Stan and Finn um, from Carol's group. Next slide, please. So post hackathon, um, Phil and I are committed to continuing to work with the gene expression team until that task is finished. Um, it's a really good use case for research objects because they, they have the input data, the output data, and the workflows, so all the whole thing. Um, and the input data is mixed between local and remote data sources. So we have a really nice, very broad use case for RO crates. Um, and the target is that we'll have an RO crate described deposit of all of this hackathon work from the gene expression team uh, in Zenodo, which will be discoverable by Sparkle. Um, Finn McCall at uh, UManchester will continue to update the RO crates libraries once the crate spec 1.1 is stable. And I'm going to extend those uh, in an attempt to natively use LDP as a back end, uh, somewhat like if you could imagine active crates in a similar way that the uh, um, Ruby does these things with the uh, with the backends. Okay, so that's the update. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Do we have any questions Sorry again. for Mark? No, no, no. It's okay. Do we have any questions for Mark? Oh, we have one from Egon. Um, then could we please unmute Egon so he can answer the question? Uh, is there a tutorial on how to make RO crates? Um, is there a tutorial? Uh, Stian, is there a tutorial? Uh, we didn't. We didn't create one. Uh, my my code because all of the crates that I was making were in almost entirely remote. Um, my code is pretty hacky because I'm getting around little blocks uh, in it, using the libraries that were never intended to be used that way. So, so I, I didn't. Um, I didn't uh, make a tutorial myself, but Stian and the, the RO Crates team may have one somewhere that I'm, I'm unaware of. Good. Um, okay, if anyone from the RO Crates. Uh, hi, uh, hi I, I, I'm from the RO Crate crowd. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, and as Stian and Finn all work for me, uh, I can do things like say, yeah, I will make them write a tutorial. So um, 
uh, I yeah, so I think this is a good idea. And um, there's also not only that, but uh, we're also making a Python library, um, Egon, for um, RO Crate, not just the Ruby library. And as part of the uh, Python library um, activity, we're including the tutorials. So I think this is a priority that I'm going to take back. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so I, I think we got our question. Do we have any other question for Mark or Fair Data? Well, I have a question. Mark, you talk about the verification of various uh, national COVID data sets. Right. Together with this verification, did you create any kind of tips or guidelines for other countries to do a similar thing? Um, no. So, so it. No. <laughs> so in every every country's data set is sufficiently different that we sort of have to customize every transformation. Um, and so the only standard that we followed was the the bio schema. Um, they have a minimal information standard that uh, should be used to capture the metadata for crates. So I use that plus um, some uh, additional tags uh, inside of that um, that RO crate, which were uh, domain specific. So coronavirus as an ontology term, uh, clinical observations, um, hospitalization. Um, mortality, ontology terms like that are, are now included in the RO crate. It's not actually part of the RO crate spec. So I guess that would be a recommendation, but that wasn't something we formalized. Uh, Mark, maybe I, I can add something it's, um, about that topic. It was an interesting yeah. uh, action. We, split, we, we coded, we, I created a JSON uh, data package for, for the actual report. So we can mark up uh, each of the field with the schema.org tags, which have been released by um, by Dan recent, just for the, the occasion. So, in a way, we even if there is a different, slightly difference in table, we can have a, a the RDF typed for each of these matrices that are coming, and that could be a recommendation that we could issue. It's not perfect. There are gaps we identified, for instance, uh, because they are based on the um, uh, CDC. Uh, tables uh, that was published, and the, interestingly, there are gaps in terms of they don't report to the location of things. So, but that could be the recommendation we could make. That's the friction is data level, yeah. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we can see, uh, based on these comments, how difficult verification is um, and how important it is as well. Mark, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, Let's thanks. go to move uh, to where we were. So, yes, machine learning is our next topic. Uh, Philip, please go ahead. Um, hi, this is Fotis, not Philip. Um, oh, hi, Fotis. <laughs> no, no, it's 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 fine. Uh, we had so um, we had a call with Philip um, like two in the morning his time, um, and um, I think the 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 overall idea was that you should um, not wake up too early in the morning for this. Uh, so I'll pick this up and I'll try to um, to be as detailed as possible. So um, a quick outlook of what uh, the machine learning group has has uh, done. So basically we focused a lot on trying to um, identify predictor predictors from um, sequencing data and uh, we did this at various different levels. Um, so one of them is based on um, word to vec approaches using the uh, open reading frames. Uh, this was uh, done by uh, by Marco and he actually uh, they actually created a Jupyter notebook um, that produced this, um, this exact um, approach. Uh, another uh, setup was to ident try to identify potential um, k-mers of interest for various lengths of k. Uh, this was done by Anastasis, and um, the focus here was uh, on the uh, 281 uh, fully sequenced coronaviruses in uh, GenBank. 
And uh, the ultimate goal was to apply some sort of clustering on them to identify predictors. You can see the picture on the uh, left-hand side. Uh, it's a first analysis, as you can see, uh, a lot of the cameras, which are columns in this instance, uh, have a very, si very similar profile. So uh, focus on the next step is to try to figure out predictors from that. Uh, another approach um, done by Philip uh, was to uh, identify um, potential predictors and features based on um, secondary structure, again, using the open reading frames uh, on that. Um, uh, it was a quite interesting approach because there were some uh, persistent secondary structures um, that sort of emerged. Um, again, something to be fed into a, an analysis process from later on. And another approach uh, done by Justin, uh, if I recall, uh, was to focus on the epitope um, and try uh, to identify the features and put them in as um, as inputs for uh, different clustering approaches using PSIME, GMAP, and so forth. Again, there we prefer a set of notebooks that sort of um, showcase how this analysis have, has worked. And the ultimate um, end to that is to have a set of predictor data tables that can be used for further analysis, be they on um, or based epitope based or stakeholder structural based uh, features. Next slide, please. So, um, what is the expected outcome? Um, if we would like to put it as a single like line uh, is to try to figure out non-traditional applications for machine learning algorithms for omic sequence analysis. So try to see what we can design, what we can implement um, as uh, approach to figure out features from, uh, from omics data. We've already done that to an extent, but the outcome, the real outcome that we would like is to go to a set of predictors from multiple approaches and essentially move from a functional profiling perspective towards actual predictive models. Right now, what we do have, as you've seen, is basically methods to extract features, and we have a, um, a small issue enough, but it's, I think it's, it's interesting enough set of, of data tables that someone can play around with. Um, make sure that there is a um, consistent match between the sequences and um, any type of uh, continuous representations that we, we have. And also, we do have a set of individual features that need to be defined predictors. So moving ahead, um, we already have uh, have had like um, four Zoom meetings uh, along the week, plus continuous interaction over the, the channel. Um, but we are definitely moving forward with uh, with the work beyond um, the official end of the biohackathon. Um, our ultimate goal is to have these methods as a um, Python library or toolkit similar to the scikit-learn uh, vectorized function, but this is for dedicated for omics. And in order to do that, we would um, definitely like to have some extra Python skills around because we are basically um, novices in that sense. Um, based on what we've done so far, we will aim for a single publication on the entire methods that we've sort of designed and implemented. Uh, we're thinking about 1000, but anything along this way would be okay. Um, the expected outcome for that would be about early May for the results and publication, but the actual toolkit as a full functioning um, um, software module will probably come later. And uh, we already put uh, a lot of this um, information as a single report uh, in, our, um, in our repository, uh, still in draft, but this should be done somewhere uh, over the next week or so. And that's it. Thank you, Fortis. I think the next one is by Stats. No, so uh, let's go into um, see if anyone has any question for Fortis regarding the matching learning topic. Anyone raising the hand? I cannot see any question posted in the QA channel. Okay, I, I have a question for this. Um, at the very beginning, it was mentioned that one of the possible topics of this machine learning group would be um, on X-rays and images to compare lungs on COVID patients against uh, lungs on patients suffering from other uh, respiratory diseases or coronaviruses. Was anything done uh, toward this end? 
Uh, the short answer is no, uh, because we had a very short discussion in the beginning about um, actually looking at the data available. And the consensus was that the data itself is not really either usable or really represented, representing um, something that we can base any model upon. So that's why we sort of dropped this particular um, idea. Okay, good. Thank you. I, I had a particular interest on, on that one. That's why I'm asking. Thank you, Fotis. Okay, let's going to move uh, to the next topic. Uh, this topic is knowledge graphs, and I will do the presentation. So the knowledge graph um, was split in two different projects. This first project that we are presenting today here uh, is about a user interface, a facet browser to navigate through literature annotated on terms related to COVID and SARS. And um, the annotation model that was used is uh, PICO annotation. PICO stands for Population Intervention Comparison and Outcomes. So the first sets were um, created around these uh, four topics. The main focus uh, during this biohackathon was the user interface. Um, in order to create an initial draft, we used the annotated corpus from SciByte and we loaded it into a Neo4j. Neo4j was uh, the um, graph uh, database that we decided to use for this project. We worked during this uh, week on a story storytelling and an initial graph for this uh, facet browser, and also in a model alignment uh, regarding the clinicaltrials.gov, which we want to integrate um, later. Um, for the future work, we we will continue working on this browser. We hope to have a open uh, to the public version in about uh, two weeks. We will continue uh, working on tests and improvements on this user interface uh, facet browser. We will do integration of clinical trials. We want to add more information about location and population to the annotations. And we have seen so far that for the population, we will have to probably do some customization depending uh, on the different regions. And we also want to integrate more annotations, uh, most probably coming from uh, the Biotea project. Biotea is, is a model uh, for annotations on literature based on the bibliographic ontology and um, using NCBO annotator and some others. So we will integrate that information in order to have a more comprehensive uh, collection, annotated collection in here. Uh, we also need to work on uh, what is our update plan because, of course, we need to, to keep getting more information from the literature that uh, is being published at a really, really rapid pace about COVID. And we need to annotate this. So, so we need to, to define what our update plan uh, is, and it has to be on a regular basis and to kind of really quickly. And we will work also on the Biohack Archive uh, submission. And um, here we have a picture of um, a retrieval that we have been working on on the interface. So we have a drug and the population showing a particular set of symptoms. And uh, later we also want to retrieve the clinical trials and papers about this drug. And uh, we want to also add geolocation and population elements in there. I don't think we have the presentation from the other knowledge graph groups. They were working on a knowledge graph, purely knowledge graph, no user interface as far as I remember. Uh, do we have any questions uh, for the knowledge graph topic? Okay, I will not ask questions to myself. So let's going to move to the text mining and analysis group. I don't know, maybe we should move to the next one. Yes, I suppose. Hello? Let me go quickly through here. Okay, this one says project two. I hope project one will come later, but let's going to start with this one. Uh, Tanasis, please go ahead. Hello, I, um, I just kept uh, uh, the numbering from the previous uh, presentation, and uh, that was the second project of the text mining and analysis group. Anyway, uh, let me remind you, our project is uh, relevant uh, to applying topic modeling algorithms on 
uh, court uh, 19 uh, texts. Um, as I said uh, on Wednesday, uh, we had uh, co completed the data collection um, gathering uh, all the abstracts from the CORD19 dataset that contains publications uh, that are relevant to uh, COVID-19 and uh, also uh, to other coronaviruses. And um, uh, we had also collected the full text from the same dataset and the text from uh, some tweets uh, from the COVID-19 tweet IDs dataset. Uh, our original plan was uh, to also apply, this, apply the same uh, processing uh, on these uh, uh, datasets. Uh, however, uh, we will not uh, manage to, uh, to do it uh, in the context of this hackathon. We will uh, keep them and uh, uh, test them uh, in the future, in the near future. Uh, our analysis, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we used um, uh, the coherence score and the perplexity analysis uh, uh, using different uh, uh, sizes of models, uh, which means uh, different uh, number uh, of topics uh, for each model. And uh, we, we used uh, two collections uh, of uh, the data set with abstracts. The first one contained all the, uh, all the abstracts, uh, while the second one only uh, a subset that contains articles published in 2020. Uh, this was done because uh, after an initial interpretation of the models, uh, many, um, many others uh, told us that uh, uh, some of the topics uh, are not very relevant uh, to the current outbreak. So uh, we uh, created this second uh, subset uh, uh, just to have a more uh, focused uh, collection of texts that are uh, about uh, the current outbreak. And uh, uh, based on the analysis uh, of coherence and perplexity, uh, we found that uh, 40 uh, topics was uh, good for uh, the the collection with uh, articles uh, from 2020, uh, while uh, 60 uh, topics uh, worked better for the whole uh, collection. Um, the results uh, will uh, we also uh, we also developed implemented a, a web interface and uh, uh, that visualizes these two. Uh, uh, models and uh, uh, all the results uh, will be uh, described in the relevant biohackive uh, paper and uh, will be available uh, on our uh, GitHub page. Uh, the link is on the slide. Um, so uh, after the hackathon, uh, we plan to uh, use the rest of the datasets we have collected and also some others and uh, also apply different configurations of the LDA algorithm. For example, for now, we just uh, used uh, topics that are in the back of words uh, uh, for form, and we will also test the uh, DFIDFs. And also, we plan to apply uh, different uh, topic modeling approaches like hierarchical LDA. Do you have a next? Uh, okay, so for this one, we will move um, to the next uh, presenter for text mining, who is Juan Banda. Thank you, Thanasis, for your presentation. We will uh, delay questions for the whole text mining groups to the end of the different presentations that they have. Uh, Juan, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yes. So the first project that we were working on during this hack uh, biohackathon was the identification of symptoms on Twitter users. And basically because we're trying to quantify, you know, how many users are claiming symptoms. Obviously, those are two very different questions with extreme degrees of difficulty between them. But what we achieved during the hackathon, we basically, uh, from the 150 million tweets we had, we kind of generated 300 plus million annotations, which it becomes a little bit unmanageable at that point. And we annotated using a dictionary that uses Snowmed, Mesh, and all this other 
uh, ontologies. So what we decided is like, okay, fine. We've seen that other groups, uh, especially EHR, uh, well, hospitals release their sets of common symptoms based on mining their EHR notes. So we took those lists instead and actually used those to narrow down to see if they match. And actually, they match pretty well. So it's common that you know a lot of those symptoms are uh, appear in the EHR or people that go to the EHRs, they, they, they get documented, but also we find them people talking about those on Twitter. So we did manage to find around 440,000 unique users that mentioned symptoms. Again, this is, you know, this is step one. So we needed to identify who mentions them. However, you know, the, the biggest step and the stuff that uh, is coming up next is that we actually need to go through those users, mind their, you know, timelines and actually ascertain if they actually had them themselves or they were just mentioning, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, they saw it on an article, they were quoting somebody else. So we need to go back and do, and do that. But at least, you know, we were able to zoom in on, uh, on a population that we believe you know, could have, uh, we can find what we're looking for. So whatever is post-hackathon, we need to collect additional data for those users. We, prov we need to provide, obviously, manual review and annotation, and then build the models to actually annotate this ascertainment of, you know, people's having users. And uh, we want to expand the chart term list because we do find... Uh, hundreds of other symptoms that were not mentioned in the you know frequent EHR list that might be of importance. So we're actually looking at that. Uh, going to the GitHub, you can actually see more details. You can see the code we use. We can see the dictionaries that we were using. So feel free to do that, and also the bio uh, um, the bio archive thing uh, is it's underway. Good. Do you have um, a following slide, Juan? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so the other project that we were doing, this was uh, headed by uh, my my PhD student Ramya. Uh, she was looking into trying to characterize you know, the information or misinformation around potential treatments. This is a hot topic issue because at least here in the U.S., our president has been recommending a certain drug that uh, without considering it too much, at least with no medical uh, background. So we were trying to see if we could track that and we can track it, you know, to which tweets or which news articles, you know, were, were influencing people the most. So we went off and uh, since uh, my PhD student works in identifying drugs with uh, tweets with drug mentions, we had, uh, she was, uh, did her her thing and identified around you know 1900 unique drug terms that people were talking about and around a, a million tweets so if you notice you know the, it goes from 150 million to 1 million very quickly but this is normal as other researchers have shown the prevalence of tweets that actually talk about drugs is very low and you can see that here at least here it's a little bit it's usually should be around three percent, but he's a little bit boosted up because, uh, 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 and and in our data said because you know there were drugs to, uh, that were led to believe people could take. So obviously the terms, the, the most frequent terms, the uh, chloroquine is uh, the the one that uh, uh, that's been touted the most. So now we we're able to find that. However, we need to, you know, now validate, you know, uh, where does that information is coming and what kind of thing are people saying on those tweets so some people might be saying do not take some people might be saying yeah take it i, I read here so we're now in the step of okay we have this million tweets with those drugs let's see where you know where the common thread of you know somebody retweeting somebody or some news article so we need to validate the results post hackathon scale the experiments you know we're trying to uh, pick up more because there's a lot of misspellings and the previous uh, project misspellings accounted for at least one fourth of all the data we pulled. So we need to uh, apply the misspelling stuff for drugs as well. And we want to, you know, man manually annotate some stuff, build some models later on. So we're at that stage as well in this project. Okay, thank you, Juan. Um, I just will move to see we have, yes, we do have another text mining group. So let's uh, have this one first because before questions. Uh, so Jin Dong, please go ahead. Do we have Jin Dong as panelist? I think I saw him on the list of attendees, but I'm not sure if he 
is the panelist. Hello. Hi, Dean Dom. Please go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Jin Dong Kim from uh, Tokyo, and we were working on this uh, COVID-19 problem notation project. Uh, its goal was to collect uh, annotations uh, made to COVID-19 related literature collections. And uh, we were working with two literature collections. One was uh, lit COVID uh, made available by NCBI on James Road. And the other was uh, COR-19. Um, and we were collecting, uh, so we were not ourselves generating uh, annotations to those uh, literature data sets, but we were collecting annotation data sets uh, produced by uh, many different groups, and we were kind of integrating uh, those data sets. And um, so the progress is on the next slide. Uh, can you show, uh, Lila, can you show the next slide? Uh, yes. Actually, yes. The, the, ne the next one. Yes. Uh, not this one. Yes. Not this one, the next one. Next one? This one? No. It should be this one. Oh. Should I refresh okay. the presentation? So it seems like, I think on this better. Uh, it seems someone slide it is gone. Okay, let me let me refresh quickly the presentation. Maybe we didn't have it there, and we need to refresh a bit. In any case, so doing so. This one is probably the one that you were looking for, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So this slide shows um, those uh, notation data sets we were working with. So uh, so various uh, notation data sets like um, cell lines and uh, discourse elements, uh, biomedical term normalization. And uh, we also had on another PICO uh, notation data sets contributed by uh, University of Melbourne. And, um, uh, pop data annotation and epistemic uh, statements. Uh, so some of them are already on uh, public notation and uh, some of them are uh, on their way to public notation. And uh, uh, the next slide shows a simple uh, example of searching over those uh, annotation data sets. This is really a simple uh, uh, Example of search, so it shows uh, it's a sparker uh, searching for uh, SARS coronavirus uh, mentioned together with uh, uh, anatomical uh, locations. So uh, every annotation uh, data set uh, uploaded to pub annotation will be uh, converted to RDF and they will become searchable using uh, sparker and. Um, so uh, this is the current uh, state, and uh, uh, so we planned to make the first official release of the data set actually on today, but um, it was uh, delayed, and uh, we are now uh, aiming at uh, the first release of the data set next week. Uh, and uh, if you go back to the first slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we have a um, homepage and the mailing list. So if you want to be uh, informed, uh, please uh, look at the homepage and um, subscribe to the mailing list. That's it for me. Thank you, person. Thank you, Dean Long. Let's go to see if we have, okay, we don't have um, more projects from the text mining group. So let's go to take some questions. Do we have anyone raising their hand? I have a question. I have a question for Juan. So I'm going for Juan. So I'm going to take advantage of this. 
Um, so, Juan, you mentioned 150 million tweets. Are all of them in English? No, this is the, the around 85% of them are in English and the, the rest are in uh, Spanish, then French, and then uh, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one more question. Are you going to do any sentiment analysis maybe in order to identify whether people were saying, oh, these were for me, these didn't? Yes, actually, we run sentiment analysis and everything, and we're preparing uh, some sort of publication on that. So, yeah, that, that's a very good question, and it should be ready soon. I'll send you the preprint when we have it up. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Any other question for the text mining projects? Okay. Just, just a comment for Ding Dong. We will see how to contribute uh, to POV annotation as well with uh, our annotations on this topic. So thank you, Ding Dong, uh, Juan, and uh, Talasis for your presentations. Let's going to move to the next topic, Wikidata, with Andra. Andra, please go ahead. Hi. And um, yes, I'm reporting back. Uh, we had a very interesting group, uh, various threads that one uh, that worked on Wikidata. Wikidata being the in, uh, in the, um, link data repository of the Wikimedia Foundation, who also uh, hosts uh, Wikipedia. Roughly speaking, we had threads around data infrastructure, data, Sparkle queries, and uh, schemas. Uh, a set of existing tools have been uh, extended and added by the participants in the, in the group. We uh, converted and aligned data sets from uh, three data sets being Wikipathways, Complex Portal, and the ICS, ICTV virus taxonomy with Wikidata. And we extended um, um, tools like BridgeDB, who create, who provide identifier mapping, Scolia, which has citation graphs, uh, and um, well, I, I can recommend everyone to go to the different um, repositories. One of the subsets, one of the threads in um, in the, in the Wikidata chan uh, cha channel was subsetting, and Wikidata itself is a very large open uh, world uh, database, and sometimes the, the, the queries time out. So there are many use cases to extract subsets of uh, what is known, what exists in Wikidata, but not only what to what extent, but also how complete an, uh, an item is being described in Wikidata. Um, the question is how do you how do you describe these uh, these these entities? And so a lot of effort was done in creating checks and uh, state uh, checks uh, expression uh, shape expressions. And there were various shape expressions described, being um, on preprints, hospitals, viruses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They were either created manually, where a group of domain experts just sit down and write those shape expressions. Or um, they were extracted by uh, various tools uh, that that exist, uh, such as um, Shaxer and Shape Designer, that takes a subset of a graph and then extract the shape expression from that set, and then the, uh, the audience uh, uh, prune that in a better in a better schema description. However, for the however, it takes a bit of time for uh, people to uh, it takes a bit of time to learn shape expressions. So, um, for the subset abstraction, we didn't want to rely too much on on shape expression, but would actually like to collect as many uh, definitions as one can find that can be a shape expression, but it can be bioschemas or that can be a set of Sparkle queries. So for that to create, we started a Wikibase on uh, a platform uh, which is called wikibasestack.com, where one can create Wikibases being the schema corf. And what the schema corf does is it collects all the schemas, whether that's a shape expression, a Sparkle query, or bioschemas, and the really and points to the data sets and the um, uh, and, and possible queries. Furthermore, uh, two other uh, shape expressions, uh, two other Wikibases were created. One being, um, let me check, but it's one for the viruses, and uh, where we want to describe the virus taxonomy as complete as possible before we push it to Wikidata. And the third one is one on preprints. And future step is, um, that uh, and we're going to develop the wiki bases as they have been. We're going to mature 
the different shape expressions and um, we're working on the HackMD in uh, which will be the final report of our developments this week. Next slide please. Here we see one of the one of the, some screen dumps. So on the left, there is a screen dump of uh, uh, the preprint Wikibase. Uh, in the top right corner is a visualization of a, sp uh, a shape expression that has been uh, described during this week. Uh, and then to the bottom, there is the, a pointer to the Wiki Pathways portal with uh, uh, some elements that have been added in the in this uh, session. Next slide, please. This was my first uh, hackathon where I brought my kids along and uh, they actually participated and uh, they have provided to the wiki, uh, to this hackathon uh, community these logos which are up for grabs and reuse. And this is how they viewed how, uh, how, uh, what I was doing this week. And that was my, uh, I hope I have covered it all. I guess not, but. Thank you very much, Andra. Well, we always have the GitHub uh, wiki pages to add more information there in case anyone is missing anything on, on these presentations, which can happen, of course. Do we have any questions for uh, Wikidata people? I will ask a question. Um, so, you mentioned that uh, you have subsets um, from Wikidata specializing in some particular topics. How well the Federation queries work on them? No, no, that's a, no. We don't have those subsets. We are actually yeah. still developing the infrastructure. We have some preliminary prototypes that will take now. They only work on shape expressions, where you take you where you define a shape expression and it takes the shape expression as input. And uh, it will then uh, extract that subgraph from the from the graph, but that's where we are, and and so we're still building uh, the uh, the ways on how to describe those subsets. That this was exactly what we wanted to do with Schema Corp, to have a wiki in place where uh, pointers to schemas, queries, and data sets. But we haven't touched on the on the completeness or how how well they work with within each other. That's mm -hmm. definitely future work. Good. Thank you very much, Ambro. Um, you have some comments on the QA, comments rather than questions. They are loving the logos. <laughs> and we are so happy to see um, the presentation of, of the, um, the drawings that your kids uh, have contributed to this biohackathon. It's, it's nice to see that this was a family biohackathon yes. for some of the participants as well. Thank you, Andre. I really, like, I really enjoyed also the cats and kids that walked by when we had the different calls. Oh, yes. <laughs> we, we had a kind of daily, multiple um, meetings on our Wikidata group. And, and we had, yes, kids, uh, family, pets around. And uh, yeah, it, it was, was nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Andre. Let's go to move uh, to the next topic. By statistics, uh, and the presenter will be Yane. So please, Yane, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so what we've been doing in the biostatistics group uh, is that we we built a SARE model, which can include multiple uh, different kinds of compartments. That is, for example, age groups. This SARE model can be used to, for example, predict locally the the ICU or hospitalization requirements. Um, we built uh, created data sets uh, for, for using the SARE model and for modeling. Um, and then we have a lot, lot of uh, various kinds of data which we have yet, yet to use. So climate data, uh, country demographics and so on. And this will be what we'll be doing in the near future. We also have a, a web user interface for this model almost ready, so other people can easily play with it. I think uh, Otis is taking the, the next slide. Looks like. Thank you, Jan. So <laughs> let's going to have a Fortis now. All right, so um, 
as Jana said, there was a lot of work done around actually the model itself. Um, I would like particularly to mention the curation that um, Felicita, Cecilia and Laura did in terms of figuring out the policies and the particular data points that can come from individual countries and how they can be implemented in a way that this can be worked. And uh, based on the presentations that have been done so far, uh, I think that would be a, an interesting point to see how they can be so sort of verified on one hand and actually can be reused for other um, other approaches as well. Uh, but moving on to um, to the expected outcome. So the first one is um, basically to extend the same model so it can be applied for uh, meta populations. So this is essentially how um, a, a country can be split into counties and how they can have all these different um, characteristics and they should be included in the, um, in the model itself. Um, a secondary approach would be to um, evaluate whether the simulation of the model itself can um, reflect the reality, so see if it can be used as a predictor. Um, uh, a key point uh, is to um, see whether the simulations that we can do based on the existing data uh, can lead us to an understanding of how the parameters change over time or across different countries or across different policies or across different um, climate or weather conditions and uh, try to see whether there is a correlation or a pattern between those two aspects. So the model, as you've seen, it's already sort of completed. Um, the link to the uh, repository is on the slides. Um, a genetic algorithm fitting uh, process that takes this as a black box and tries to do this sort of a parameter um, fix based on different, um, different data sets is almost in place. Uh, to actually run this from multiple scenarios and data points is something to be done in the near future. Um, all of us have sort of decided that we will continue forward with that uh, beyond the official end of the biohackathon. We do have a uh, draft of, of our process so far in the uh, repository in the form of a markdown file. Um, we do plan to submit the actual model itself as a JOSS publication um, in the near future, probably early to mid-May. Um, and depending on how the model fitting and the patterns extraction works, and if we get a, uh, a nice story out of that um, or any meaningful patterns to that end, uh, we will also try to focus for a second uh, article. Uh, obviously, it's a preprint as soon as we have something publishable and a more um, and a secondary um, publication uh, from there onwards. And uh, that would be it. I think you still have one more. Ah, right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put this in the morning. I, I already forgot about it. Uh, so, it's not the logo itself, um, but because Mike here has been uh, hearing me talk about coronaviruses like for three weeks straight, and he actually saw me that I was quite excited over the last week. I have no idea why. Um, he sort of created a representation of how a coronavirus should look like. Possibly it's something that makes people happy, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know if it's a log or not, but I, I want to share with you. Thank you very much, uh, Portis and um, Yane, and thank you to your kid, Portis, as well, for the contribution. Do we have any questions for biostatistics? Please raise your hand to our next topic, COVID phylogeny with uh, water. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, I only have uh, two things to show, but that's not because there was a lot of work being done, but just trying to keep it short. Uh, but but before I do, I just want to thank the uh, presenters and all the participants because this was really amazing and I think it's going to continue to be. And although we're all in our own houses and workplaces, I really felt a sense of community and with, with the, uh, the pets and the kids and everything else. So that's great. Um, okay, but so what, what have we been working on? Well, basically what we want to accomplish is uh, to be able to build a large phylogeny of um, the viral genomes in a kind of rerunnable way that uh, can easily be deployed by others in, in different places, right? So you sort of leave your unaligned FASTA files in, by the front door 
and out comes a, a, a pretty good tree which uh, should be scalable to thousands of genomes is kind of what we're aiming for and the idea as well at first we started out with uh, how would you do that with just the genomes that are in uh, in GenBank it's a couple of hundreds and uh, okay that's that's pretty straightforward you uh, run it through uh, some uh, multiple sequence align like MAFT or muscle and then uh, I guess what people normally do is use IQ tree to build phylogeny but then a uh, feature creep started setting in a little bit, like uh, uh, what if we actually want to have many more sequences? What if they're from different sources? Uh, for example, there's not just GenBank, but there's also sequences in this, this thing called Viper. And of course, well, I guess as discussed, there's uh, many thousands of uh, sequences in, in GIS-8. Uh, and so can you lump all of those and then do a bit of a cleaning up at first so sort of deduplicating on accession numbers deduplicating on uh, sort of just redundant sequence data because like this thing is very there's very little variation so a bunch of them are just exactly the same in in different samples uh, and then filter a bit on length because there's some uh, also some submissions that might be just fragments uh, so there was a little bit of a sequence cleaning pipeline and then the alignment well it becomes kind of a, a, a bit of more of a scalability challenge when you're trying it out with like 5000 genomes or something like that so uh, we did some coding to make that run uh, remotely uh, on the uh, cypress uh, uh, hpc portal they made uh, extra uh, compute resources available for COVID 19 analyses so that was very kind uh, and then to do that in a kind of divide and conquer way. So you first align uh, different chunks that are just like kind of th the right size to go through pretty quickly. And then you do profile alignments to combine them all in one one super alignment. And we have that almost running, uh, it looks like. Um, but I, I guess there was uh, to orchestrate that with the web service was a bit more work. And then the phylogeny will probably get running uh, this weekend. Uh, and so then that little pipeline is in a Docker container and um, basically good to go. It won't be very uh, uh, computationally intensive locally because this, you know, is delegated to this portal remotely. So so you might, you know, should be able to just run that on a laptop. Then what's in the meantime is also going on, and Tasro did, did amazing work here uh, to provide CWL I guess, uh, you know, interface descriptions uh, for uh, nearly all of the steps. There's one more to go. And so what we're aiming for here is to have this Docker container done and pushed into Docker Hub to have the CWL so that we can uh, register the, the workflow at the, the Workflow Hub. Uh, and that kind of should be doable by the end of this weekend, you know. Famous last words, but probably pretty close. Uh, and uh, so then that would be uh, the first paper for the biohacker archive. Uh, and, but meanwhile, uh, you know, we're going to continue. There's a couple of different uh, uh, interactions that are relevant here. So on the front end, there's, you know, data coming in. So there's uh, data that's basically already aligned from the pan genomes. And um, so we're pretty, getting pretty close to just have that in a format that we can uh, ingest that. And of course, there's data coming in from uh, hashtag public sequence resource. So that's kind of on the, on the consumption side. And then on the other end, there's a bunch of uh, downstream analyses that, uh, and sort of this is further research beyond the initial preprint. Uh, for what we can actually do with with the tree, so one of them is to uh, combine these these genomes, the genome data and the signatures of selection on the coding regions, with what the uh, annotations on structures uh, group is doing. Because then, if we don't know something about with these proteins, and we know something about the signatures of selection, all that is kind of a cool story to bring together. Uh, and uh, another thing that's, uh, uh, I guess, just a very obvious step to make 
uh, if we have this tree building pipeline is that this uh, sort of preprint or paper came out on Virological by, uh, I guess, Andrew Rambo and uh, uh, Oliver Pybus and Eddie Holmes, who developed for the, for the British data this kind of classification system for the major clades, and it would be useful to just apply that logic to this larger superset of data so that you can kind of tell in which groups these different uh, genomes come out just as kind of like a language to talk about the different strains that are circulating um, so that that is a little bit more uh, for the future but uh, for this uh, this uh, preprint and just getting the basic workflow uh, going well on the on the git repo we've uh, sketched out a little a pipeline or like you know like uh, Different issues organized uh, towards a milestone, which is going to be like a week from now. We think we're we're good to go with just getting that uh, that preprint out, and and then we just keep working going forward and and keeping this conversation going. So that was my uh, my main uh, thing to mention uh, or uh, to report back. And I guess one more thing is as we advance to the next slides. Uh, thank you. So here you can kind of see that actually, of course, this this is can be done. And so this is the tree that uh, one of us in the group built, the standalone from the GenBank genomes, uh, aligning with MAFT and building with IQ tree locally, and and then visualizing that in ITOL. So this is basically what we want, but then uh, a bit more scalable and uh, just rerunnable uh, in the cloud, so that you know as as data accumulates, this can just be run as a process uh, without knowing too much about uh, the gory details. So that's where we are, and uh, I'm uh, I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you, Roger. Do we have any question for Philo Jenny? Anyone waving a hand? <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to move to the next topic then. Thank you, Roger. Okay. So we have an adaptation on structures with Gerardo. Please go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so on the on the annotation for on, on, on structures front, what we what we tried to achieve really was to find interesting annotations that we could um, display on top of structures that we have in, in our Swiss model repository. And I would say we, we, we got some, some very interesting progress done in, in, in this hackathon on that, uh, discovered some issues that we wouldn't have thought of ourselves and, uh, and, and, and managed to fix a lot of them. Um, so to showcase what what this what this means in the first place on the picture on the on the on the left you can see the the table uh, on, on on the top left it's essentially annotations in this context just means whatever you can map onto a location um, with respect to a uniprot sequence um, you can assign it a color you can assign it a little text. Um, and you can see it in the context of whatever structural data is available at the time. And of course, we have observed that structural data keeps on coming in uh, every week. There's new uh, structures released in the in the PDB. Um, on top of that, there's also work being done to extend the structural coverage with with models, and we do some of those uh, ourselves with uh, with this model. And so on the left at the end, you have uh, a set of annotations that was uh, manually extracted from literature from one of the participants um, that, uh, that has a, a specified text on what, what each of those residue positions mean. In this case, uh, these are all locations in the receptor binding domain of the, of the spike protein. Uh, and you see the, the, the host protein, the ACE2 human protein on the top. Um, on the right, we have an example of something that we could script. So basically, with an automated processing uh, within a Python script, we could extract whatever variation we observe between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. We could look at, um, at nucleotide binding sites extracted from P53 
PDB structures which have actually no sequence similarity whatsoever with the RNA polymerase of SARS-CoV, but they have a strong structural similarity. Uh, and as a result, it's possible to superpose the, the binding site um, on top of the SARS-CoV structure, and we can make a reasonable prediction on where you would expect nucleotides to bind uh, in the context of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA polymerase, which is displayed on the right. Um, if we if we move to the to the next slide, I can give a bit of more of an, uh, uh, well, I can give one more example of what can be done. So for the um, 3CL uh, pro protein, there's there's a large amount of structures in the in the PDB. So what one can do if you map all of those structures onto the same reference sequence, so the Unicode sequence, um, you can superpose all of them. You can see where they differ, and you can make a color gradient that tells you where you have more variability and where you have less variability. Um, which in this case here, you see most of it is very highly conserved and just uh, the small bit that is, in, that is in green really has any noticeable variability if you compare different ligands that bind in that pocket to this display there. So, um, so what do we have? We have a, we have a GitHub repository that uh, that is ongoing. People are, uh, are contributing to it, or pushing to it, or commenting on it. Um, we have uh, well the examples that I, the three examples that I just mentioned. There's more annotations that could be extracted from from literature, and extracted from literature can be like in this case it was a manual effort of actually going through the literature. But of course, one can also use databases which have curated content which they themselves extract from literature. So for example, there is uh, efforts on protein-protein uh, interactions that you could take from PDB and extract them by script. Um, so we have a plan on how to do that, but we, we haven't really started with it yet. Um, there's additional things that one could extract from the available structures beyond the um, variation analysis that I showed you on the right. Um, we're, we're still working on mapping uh, variations. So we started processing data from NextTrain, but we're also looking at, uh, um, at, at collaborating with the, with the phylogeny group and using their output, as, as was mentioned before. And so moving, so moving forward, we, I mean, we want to continue this effort and, uh, and, and try to finish the, the, the annotation efforts that were started. Um, we, we hope to keep, um, that we can keep this going um, beyond this, uh, this hackathon, that we can get this as a community effort for more people to, to provide their annotations. So we make it as, as simple as possible in terms of what you need to, um, to do with your data. All you need is to map your positions to a Unicode sequence, provide a color and provide a text, dump it into a CSV file, and that's basically all we need. Um, so I, 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 could, I could see plenty of, of more inputs from the process data from the other hackathon topics that could come in here. Um, in terms of the biohack archive uh, markdown, um, I, will, uh, I mean, it's, it's for now essentially an empty shell that exists as a pull request. Um, but uh, we'll try to include all the efforts that have been done, at least within this week, uh, to at least have something concluded that we can say, okay, this is the um, the efforts that have been done so far, um, but I don't see this really as an as an end for this effort, uh, but rather as a reporting of what has been going on so far. So yeah, that's all from from our side. I want to thank again all the all the all the organizers, all the people that contributed to this topic, and also all the other topics. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead, or uh, you can always ask also later in, the, in this lecture. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Do we have any questions for Gerardo right now? OK, so you can, oh, yes, we do have a question. Um, so this is from Ivan. Ivan, I think you can unmute yourself. 
Could you please go ahead with your question? Uh, hello, Gerardo. That's uh, probably a question which will also be interesting for most the other um, workflows and uh, pipelines that were developed in this hackathon. Uh, do you think, uh, can you think uh, about your preferred uh, method for sending data from the reports of the variation that are detected by our types of pipelines? So you mentioned it quickly that you think about CSV files. Because, for example, on our visualizations, we would like to have clickable uh, reports where you can click and go straight to the visualization. Um, okay, yes. So the, the, the CSV file is essentially an, an intermediate format that allows you to upload the annotations onto, um, onto a beta feature of Swiss model. Um, once it's uploaded, you get a list of all those annotations which are clickable and get you directly to the best available structure for that location of the annotation. Um, so in that sense, it's so the CSV file is not clickable, yes, but uh, once you upload it, you get a clickable uh, interface on, on top of that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we don't have any other question for Gerardo, but we did have a question for Roger about um, phylogeny, so I'm going to read it from the QA channel. Question from Fotis, could we have the tree as a file to be used? The answer on the Slack channel was the actual file, so the answer is yes. Yep. And um, Roger, Please add a link, if possible, to the GitHub wiki so anyone know how to get this information. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It, it's just it's part of the uh, phylogeny uh, uh, Git repo. So, and the link to that is is in our slides. But I can put it on the GitHub wiki as well. It is, if it is on your slide and your GitHub repository, and there is a link from the wiki to to your GitHub, that will do. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's going to move to translation, and we will have uh, Yasunori Yamamoto to present uh, this topic. Yasunori, please go ahead. Uh, hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, it, we are translation group, and uh, just some several works going on. So first of all, uh, uh, we surveyed uh, some translation management software. So I found that there are so many TMS software, so and uh, I try to find out which is the best for us to translate uh, in terms of this stuff. Uh, the first of it, uh, did to have synchronization, and also it's free, and also uh, as you know we also use a text write down in a Markdown format. So uh, I try to support. Uh, I try to find any software to support Markdown. And there are some of these TMS software, but this, uh, there are some pros and cons. So we try to keep uh, surveying this kind of software for which is the best for us. Another thing is also some of us uh, started to work on translating. So we put some contents of the URL that down here. So if you are interested in, please check this uh, contents. And also we worked on developing a script to list up some prospective Wikipedia article to be translated. Uh, this is uh, Android work. And uh, currently there are not so many Wikipedia articles to be uh, listed up. So he is going working on to improve the functionality of this script. And also, also I, it, I think it's very good tool uh, found. So Wikidata, there's a nice tool for translation. It's a uh, uh, tabernacle. Uh, I don't know how to uh, pronounce, uh, pronounce this, but it's a tabernacle. It's very good for us to, if we want to translate a uh, Wikidata item. So, Please check this URL. And the next one uh, is an expected outcome. So it's also 
uh, as you know, the translation takes much, much time. So even this hackathon, we couldn't finish any translation. So I also we are going working on. Uh, so even in the post hackathon, so keep in touch with those involved. Yes, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Henry. Mm -hmm. Do we have any mm -hmm. questions about translation? I don't see any question on the QA channel either. So let's go into more. Mm -hmm. to, thank you, uh, you Yasunori. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have anyone from Serratus on the midterm presentations, and we don't have anything on the slide. So I think we will move to the next slide, unless anyone is raising a hand for Serratus. No, let's going to move uh, to the packaging in Debian. Please, Michael, go ahead. We've uh, had a, a really nice week here in Debian. Um, it was really exciting to get folks who are new to software packaging, as well as existing Debian contributors who had never worked in the biomedical world. So I noticed at least eight new contributors helped out. We got over 50 new packages finished, uh, many more in the queue. And uh, we decided to actually up our community game. We're now going to do weekly video chats and um, try to engage with people more. Um, as a, you know, if anybody, if there's a tool out there that you wish you could have app get installed it and you can't, let us know. We'll make that happen. All of Debian's responded very positively to this event. And we've seen groups all across the organization help us out and really speed up response time. Um, so it's great to keep this momentum. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Any questions about this packaging in Debian? Just a quick reminder, we don't have all the questions and all the discussion that is going on in the Q&A live here during this presentation. So please, in any case, go to the Slack channel to get more information there or post questions uh, later as well. It's OK. So let's going to move to Jane Expression with uh, Mariana Ferrarini. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good, please go ahead. Okay, um, so I mean, we had several projects on Jane Expression and we had a big group. So I'm just gonna give you a hint on what we did and what's next. Um, so our main achievements were, we have now resources with available data sets analyzed. And we also have a complete and reproducible workflow um, in order to um, um, analyze new data sets that will come in the near future. Um, so we did a lot of work in bibliography and project one was mainly into analyzing viral, uh, viral uh, transcriptomic response uh, in humans and actually trying to understand if there was something uh, specific to SARS-CoV-2 or not. Project 2 mainly focused on whether there are some proteins, human proteins, that could um, target the viral RNA. So this one, these two projects are mainly finished now. Um, and we have more or less a list of candidate genes that will then enter projects three and four. So projects three and four are still ongoing. Um, uh, we still need more data sets available. But I, I believe that we'll have them uh, soon. Uh, I believe that we'll be able to, to do much more here. But we're going to leave the methods available on the GitHub um, even before that. And project five would be to actually, okay, so how are you going to uh, deliver all of this information to the medical community? And uh, it's still ongoing and uh, we'll also leave the methods available for everyone. Um, project six already uh, also finished uh, mainly workflows for projects one and two. And as soon as we have everything for the other projects, uh, they will help us finish. Um, so I, right now, I mean, we're ongoing on half of them and we are already mainly at the end for, for some of them. Uh, we already have a bio, Biohack Archive markdown, but it's still on pro in progress. So we'll, we'll be updating that on, uh, later on this week. And um, I believe that that's pretty much it. But I, I would really like to like thank everyone that worked 
in this project, especially people from workflows, uh, NFCore and Fair Data, who are actually helping us um, make everything fully available and open to everyone that wants to work with anything that we've done. So it's very, very nice. And of course, thank the, the organizers because uh, uh, this was a really, really, really intense but uh, awesome week. So thank you all. And thank I think the next Diana. one. Uh, um, so this is uh, a drawing for, from Rita's uh, kid, Rafael. Um, so it's just, it's not, um, it's, it's not a logo, but it's a drawing. And uh, I mean, his, his take on what we are doing. So it's Nino at the hospital. So Nino is sick and the doctor and the nurses are helping him. And we are, well, his mom and all of us are actually helping on the computer, help uh, doctors and uh, nurses uh, to treat Nino. So thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you, Rafael, and thank you, Nino, for sharing with us um, the presentation and this nice drawing. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have um, questions so far, but we do have a comment uh, from Carol. So, Carol, if you want to go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm Mariana. Are you planning on putting these uh, next flow workflows into the workflow hub? And if so, we can help you with that because we know the next flow ZWL is tricky, but we can do native NF core um, harvesting over your uh, GitHub. Yeah, I mean, I, we can definitely do that. I can talk to uh, the people that are actually building the workflows and we can definitely leave it also available for this. Okay, great. We'll follow up. Okay. Thank you. More workflows for the hub. That's good. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana. Le Leila, there's a couple of questions also. There's two hands raised. Riotto. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a next presenter. Ah, okay. Um, and the other raise hand. Do we have any other raise hand? Uh, yes, uh, Will, Will raise the hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> My bad, but uh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful drawing. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, raise hands, mystery solved. Let's go into move to the next topic with Ryota. Uh, yes. Please, home learning, go ahead. Yes, uh, it's nice drawing. Uh, oh, yeah. Where's my slide? Yes, yes, sorry, my here. Yes, um, the, uh, well, we are um, making home learning material for everyone about uh, well, using uh, coronavirus genome data. And the achievement uh, so far is that uh, we've got six tutorials draft and three more proposals. And it is translated to uh, two languages, English, Japanese, right now. And uh, we have uh, um, a working draft on Thai language and French next. And we have got collaborative material editing environment using uh, VS Code and Jupyter Notebook, Google Collaboratory. And we are going to continue this effort after this hackathon to complete tutorials um, and, and also uh, for correcting feedbacks from you. We are going to get, uh, have arranged seven more meetings, meetups in the next one month. By uh, the time uh, that they expected uh, the target, targeting uh, day to release this national emergency in Japan and Thailand, so um, please join a uh, home learning channel if you're interested in, so that we are going to continue to communicate there. And, uh, and yes, uh, we are uh, going to have socializers on after, just after this wrap up. So if you have time, um, you, you can go to uh, the random channel so that you can, get this um, link to go into this room. Yes, that's it from my side. Thank you, organizers and everyone. Thank you, Riotta, for your presentation. 
Uh, do we have uh, any question for Ryota? I have one question for you. Have yes. you been collaborating with the translation um, uh, group in order to have uh, some of these home learning also in other languages? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, not yet, but uh, it's, it's quite interesting um, to hear about their uh, research, which uh, tool is uh, best for us. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, thanks, Viota. Let's go into our next topic, clinical and translational medicine data. I don't know who is presenting this one. Uh, Laila, this is Venkata. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Venkata. Yes, please yeah. go ahead. Uh, uh, can you refresh maybe the next slide? Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, I put yeah. the screenshot. Uh, Let's try to refresh. Yeah, maybe refresh. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, in this uh, topic, uh, what we did, uh, we deployed the REDCap instance. I guess most of you know REDCap uh, is a widely used electronic data capturing system from uh, Vanderbilt, and and the, that is available uh, in this uh, URL. And here we we got the uh, case uh, CRF case report forms from the uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is the one, uh, the huge effort from uh, community then they designed a uh, case report form so all the data most of the uh, countries they're using the crf to collect the clinical data so now uh, we i mean we have this red cap instance with this ca case report forms and this ready to be used and now like we need to reach the clinical colleagues i mean we will uh, we continue hosting this instance and uh, so we need to reach the clinical people and to collect the data or like in the maybe in the future, I guess like we may get the clinical data. We are very happy to curate and uh, uh, generate the data uh, in this case CRF format, so that uh, people for uh, analyzing the data can be use, easily use it. Is kind of uh, um, interoperability of the data to make the data interoperable uh, to achieve that one. So this is what we did, and if you go to the next slide, you can see the the red cap instance. And uh, it has like all the questionnaires, and it has, I mean, it has, uh, it has a one core uh, questionnaire. When the patient goes to the hospital, they will fill, and then every day follow-ups uh, questionnaires are there. So I mean, the resource is available now, and uh, maybe like we are very happy to help the clinical, uh, clinical people with this one. Only thing I think we need to advertise this one. Maybe we'll put in the uh, bio, uh, on the wiki page, and uh, so that if uh, and this one. You need you need access to uh, you need a user account. Uh, if you go to the URL, there is a uh, uh, sysadmin administrator email. Send it, and we will create accounts. So yeah, this is what we we did. Thank you very much, Venkata. Do we have any questions about the clinical and translational medicine topic? There is nothing on the channel, no raise hands. Okay, so thank you, Venkata. Let's going to move to the next topic, COVID-19 fits. I think uh, Bonfase is for this one. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so what I've been able to achieve uh, through this whole bio hackathon uh, is uh, I've been able to fetch tweets from Twitter and GitHub uh, do some basic filtering. I also fixed. I also fixed some bugs on how the tweets are being displayed, and also improved the UI, as you can see on the right. So expected outcome and how far I've gotten with this. So far, I wasn't able to get to to get people to work on this, but I got uh, a bunch of people showed interest. So that was very encouraging. I also at least have a working demo with Twitter and uh, GitHub. Uh, next page, please. Uh, so po post hackathon, what I'd really like to do is uh, I want to reach out to either the ML or text mining group and engage on more I could and engage more on how I could incorporate more useful filtering. So for example, if uh, if you, if I fetched or if I tried displaying data from the actual hashtag COVID-19 right now, there's so much noise 
I'd like to be able to like filter that out and display more useful content and specifically for a specific group working on something, uh, being able to like show specific, uh, relevant tweets that, that's useful to everyone. Also, I want to add Slack IRC. I haven't been able to do that. I wanted to do that by today, but I haven't been able to do that. So I want to be able to add Slack IRC and define a generic interface uh, so that uh, if someone wanted to extend uh, or like add other platforms like say Jitter, uh, they just have to implement methods defined in the interface and uh, that's it. Also, finally, I'd really, really want to publish the project in the official like Rocket Lang package repositories for other people to use. Uh, and that's that's it for me. Thank you very much, Pampasa. Yes, indeed, uh, one of the text mining groups are working uh, with Twitter as well, so there could be a collaboration there and you could uh, um, be a contribute to each other. Do we have any questions about the COVID-19 feeds uh, topic? Not on the channel, not here either, so let's going to move to the next one. Public sequence resource, uh, Thomas and Piotr, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Again, um, this is the last project that we present basically because it's the public sequence resource. It's that big idea that we had and what did, was the accomplishment that we well can point to. Well, we went from an idea to a working prototype in five days, and it's really impressive. Um, most people know about what we try to do here, so just a short summary. The idea was to have a platform where we can upload raw sequences. We needed metadata to go along with these submissions, so submission metadata. Once we have it uploaded, it should feed into a workflow system. So the workflow system is flexible. We have different workflows. We can combine different steps and algorithms, etc. cetera. Um, so we need also workflow metadata. And in the end, we have a data repository where we, where we can download or people can download these results and access them. So that was the vision. And we made it to a working prototype. So what's necessary to do post-hackathon, basically polish things. So I think on every step, there's thing, still things to do but we are working prototype and just a big thank you to everybody <laughs> because I didn't think it would be possible, but a lot of people worked really, really hard. And not only in the, in these projects that really are directly connected to the public sequence resource, but I also looked at the other channels and everybody worked really hard in this pile hackathon and we got a lot of things done. And actually I want to say that, people can be proud of themselves um, a little bit, I think, what we accomplished this week. And those that know me should know that I don't say something like that very often. Um, having said that, I give the mic to Piotr. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, the, the, the idea of the public um, sequence resource kicked off the whole biathlon idea. So it was the start of everything, and it's also the end of everything <laughs> by the look of it. Um, and, and, and we simply wanted to create a repository you know, that uses best practices and will allow when people upload something to do on-demand compute. Yeah, so for one important feature is that we are driving for a Creative Commons license which means that all the data that goes into the system and all the data that comes out of the system can be shared and can be used by others. Um, we, will, we are adding CWL work workflows, which are workflows that can be shared, you know, and they, they are um, transparent and arguably reproducible. Um, as outputs, we are using GFA and RDF, you know, which are also state-of-the-art um, best practice, I would say. And this output can be used by anyone. Um, what is important also is that we created a an, an, uh, an, uh, command line interface uploader, um, which allows anyone to use 
to to upload a raw sequence of the of the virus or a faster sequence with attached metadata. And um, we also created a web uploader version. Um, it's not it's not public yet, um, but essentially anyone will be able without installing any software to upload data and then have it analyzed and see the output. And to achieve all this, we, you know, we built a number of workflows. There's a faster to GFA workflow. There's a fast Q to faster workflow, which feeds into the faster to GFA workflow. Um, there's a, from the GFA, we create a linked data in the form of RDF, uh, which is combined with the metadata that's uploaded. Um, we're also working on a multi-sequence alignment workflow together with the phylogeny groups. Um, and we will add workflows. Uh, you know, if people have anything they want to they want to introduce, including machine learning, we could we could just add them. Um, we're also going to add workflows that people can prepare their data for you know depositing it into uh, other uh, public resources like EBIs or or, or uh, GIS eight. Um, so all the data and these pipelines are will always be available and they can be mirrored they can be copied um, and deployed yeah i finally wanted to thank uh, qre corp um, because they uh, made this uh, the infrastructure available and they contributed a lot of code um, it was amazing their contributions um, they also applied for an aws uh, uh, grant which we got uh, as a biohackathon for $20,000 to spend on Amazon AWS. And that's happening. Um, and yeah, we will just continue this project. It's not gonna go away. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Piotr and Thomas. Do we have any questions for the public sequence resource? Uh, big, um, just yes? saying a big thank you because these kind of resources are very valuable for a pipeline like ours. It helps to have uh, data for uh, testing them. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Do you have that's some other. What I was going to say <laughs> is uh, we're looking forward to being able to uh, just be able to visualize everything that's uh, submitted to the public sequence resource. And I think we need something similar for patient data. Because that was that was the big thing that we lived, what we ran into as a limiter is there's not a whole lot of data on patient outcomes from the hospitals. Thomas, do you want to add something? Just that you have some other congratulations on the QA channel. Excellent. Yeah. So for clinical data, of course, there's a lot of um, this. We've had a lot of discussions. <laughs> Um, because you don't want to be able to identify individuals, so, you know, there's several restrictions there. But we are pushing forward, and I think we will have optional information that we could, um, you know, pop in. I'm also I'm also delighted with the RedCap initiative because I think we may be able to, you know, converge on ideas. Um, yeah, one thing that occurred to me with patient data is uh, since there's enough quarantine going on now that's mostly local transmission, knowing the outcomes, the aggregated outcomes of a hospital and knowing which hospital a sequence came from might actually be enough to tie variants to outcomes. It's just that, um, uh, it's just that then you're kind of vulnerable to batch effects of if one hospital is just really bad about killing people off, then uh, then it might look like that variant is more deadly than it really is. Yep. Yeah. We have uh, a great uh, hand from Carol as well. So Carol, you can unmute yourself uh, whenever you want. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, did, did you mention and did I miss it uh, that uh, that these workflows are being uh, are, are available in CWL? Yes, it's yeah. all done in CWL. Yeah. So can I um, register your workflows and then point a link back to the the platform in our workflow hub? Absolutely, and vice versa. If you have any interesting workflows that could you know build on the variation graph, uh, we'd be happy to take them. Right. Yeah. Well, at the moment, I'm just interested in, you know, I'm, I'm the hub keeper. <laughs> I'm like built the library. Uh, I'm not the librarian. But uh, yeah, for sure. That would be fantastic. So so should we talk to you about uh, making sure that we, well, we can, I'm, I'm calling over your GitHub now anyhow. 
Okay. Thanks. We can, we can call a meeting uh, sometime. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thanks. Uh, hello, can you can you hear me, Laila? Yes, yes. Yeah, purely for the clinical data, that's definitely, let's follow on that one. This was the reason why we have, there is a password uh, access controlled with this instance because of the sensitive nature of the data it will come. So, I mean, we need to uh, discuss with the clinicians how they want, is it anonymized data? Is it pseudonymized data? We need to do, follow a few uh, uh, GDPR things and, you know, to make the, uh, you know, we are not. Uh, we need to provide the proper safeguards. Uh, so let's follow. When you have, when you contact with some clinical colleagues, then l let's follow on that one. Then we will provide the adequate uh, safeguards and also maybe releasing the anonymized data or something. We, we need to we need to check those things. But uh, I will be happy to be in. You know, to follow on this topic. Excellent. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Let's going to continue. This was the last topic of our presentations. Uh, so we are just uh, getting to the end soon. Just a gentle reminder, our WikiHot repository, the Twitter hashtag, questions and answers on the Slack channel. And uh, please remember to add to your GitHub wiki any links to your own GitHub repositories or to your tools or anything that you think will be useful for people uh, going to the wiki and um, willing to have more information about your topic. We have some uh, upcoming virtual events, uh, most of them already mentioned, but we have here like a quick reminder by Informatics Community Conference, eLife Innovation Sprint, Baylor Structural Variant. The three of them are hackathon styles. The next one, Lila's workshop, is uh, like a challenge style on reproducibility and Bemalo's workshop on research objects management for open link science. And of course, we have as well uh, the biohackathons, the one from uh, MBDC and DBCLS. We're still waiting uh, for a confirmation to the mailing list by the end of this month, April. And we still have the open call for the Biohackathon Europe that it is closing on the 30th of April and uh, um, should be happening in November. More information about this Biohackathon also will follow. And I think with this, we have finished our wrap up uh, presentations. Um, Michael, I don't know if you want to say anything. You had an idea about having like a follow-up on next week? Yeah, if there's interest uh, next week or in the future, maybe a month from now, of having another check-in meeting, you know, I really enjoy hearing about the other groups. Uh, I volunteer to help run that. So uh, we can pick a date in, in the general chat if people want to have a, a follow-up. Thank you, Michael. Maybe in one month, uh, we could have more results on this so we can uh, look into this. So. Uh, I want to thank everybody, and I'm pretty sure that um, we are missing some people here on these slides. My apologies for that. But um, Jane Harrow um, has been uh, a great support uh, for our presentations, our organization and everything. Alex Garcia got the slack. So thank you them for this uh, support. Thank you to all the coordinators. It was amazing what you did. It was really, really great. Just the organizers could have done nothing without the coordinators and of course, nothing without the participants on this biohackathon. Thank you everybody as well. Thank you as well uh, to people providing computing resources and uh, people making our communication easier. Thank you to the webinar presenters. We have Elixir Arvados and Com Warford Language and uh, yeah, anyone that I'm missing, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of people more have contributed to make this biohackathon a big success. And we so, are Lila, looking forward I, to see all your I, results. Lila, wait, wait, wait. Please, you're missing Peter, your, go ahead. You're missing, you're missing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, you're, you're the, you're the, you're the best. And uh, thank, thank you very much, Lila.
No, thank yeah, you all. Leila, you did an amazing amount of work. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm terribly impressed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. Thank you, Tasbo. And thank you, everybody. So, yes, we're looking forward to see uh, all your results, to see um, your publications, follow-up publications that will come later, the reports in Biohack Archive. Please keep using the hashtag on Twitter whenever you do a publication or you want to do a follow-up or you want to announce that your tool is available so we can also retweet and we can spread the voice about all the things uh, that we have been doing here. Does anyone...